and let's turn in our Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 14. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are currently going through the Gospel of John, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we find ourselves in chapter 14 today. This is uh, basically the, the last tw- 24 hours um, uh, that we're going to be looking at of the Lord Jesus' public ministry and life, and uh, very excited what the Lord has for us this morning. All right. John chapter 14, let's begin in verse 4. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it, it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He he who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. We're so thankful that you have placed it in our lives, Lord, for your purposes and to make us more into the disciples you've called us to be. We thank you that your word will outlive the heavens and the earth, and we're so blessed to be able to have you build our lives upon it, Lord. Thank you that it'll accomplish every purpose it's sent to accomplish, and thank you, Lord, that um, we we know you more through your word. So we pray that you'd set this time aside for your holy use, and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus is dealing with his disciples. He's trying to prepare them for his departure. And this is the night of his betrayal. We're going to be in this, these, these uh, last hours before his arrest for a while. We've already been in a few, this time for a few weeks, but he's very specifically saying specific things that will prepare them for his departure. And so he's telling them he's going away. So he started this conversation with them and that they can't follow where he's going. And we saw Peter last week ask the question, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Speaking of his death. And then, and then he said, um, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Well, Peter meant well. He meant to, he meant to you know, be an encouragement to Jesus. He meant to, to say he's going to be faithful and all of that, and he was being completely uh, sincere, I believe. But what he didn't know is he didn't know himself. He didn't know he didn't have the resources to lay down his life for the Lord in and of himself, and so he failed miserably, or he was going to fail miserably. And so um, he, he knew that he was going to do that. He felt like he was going to do that, but he didn't have the power to, to, to pull that off. He didn't have the resources in himself. You know, self-dependence is a trap. It's such a trap related to trying to be faithful to the Lord because apart from him, we can do nothing. We're going to see that in the next chapter, in chapter 15. We can have great intentions, but without his power and all the other things that he wants to build into our lives, we can't be faithful to him and we can't for sure lay down our lives to him. Peter had never, hadn't been baptized with the Holy Spirit yet. He hadn't witnessed Jesus raised from the dead. He hadn't failed at this point yet. He hadn't denied the Lord three times. God would use all those things in his life and in the other disciples' lives and in our lives to real, help us to realize that in and of ourselves, we don't have the power to fulfill what, our, what we may want to do in our own strength. We saw also last week in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So part of why he's going away, he revealed on those verses, part of why he's going away is to prepare a place for us. And it happened. He went and pre- he's prepared a place for us, and he will come again, as he said to the disciples, and receive us to himself. The second coming is when Jesus comes down to earth, touches down, and the, you know, the, thou- the seven-year or a thousand-year millennium is going to start at that point. But that's not what he's talking about in those verses that we saw. We go to him. He, he catches us up, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're to be with the Lord forever. I mean, he says, comfort one another with these words. So if he's not talking about the second coming, or else we wouldn't be able to comfort ourselves because we'd have to go through the seven-year tribulation, which we're not going to do, I don't believe. So this is supposed to help them not allow their hearts to be troubled. This is supposed to encourage them. There's a reason why. I'm not just going away just for no reason. I'm going away because I'm preparing a place for you. And then he's also going to add to that that he's going away um, to prepare, he's going to go away so that he can send the comforter to them. He's going to get into that um, in, a, in you know, a few verses down the road. So he's going to specifically talk about today the way to heaven. The way to heaven. The title of this message is Jesus is the only way to the Father. The way to heaven, that's something that people think about. That's what they have opinions about. Um, there's so many self-proclaimed experts on heaven. Though they've never read the scriptures, they've never studied comparative religions, they've never really looked into it, they just automatically are positive that there's many ways to heaven. It's called pluralism. And, and so Jesus is going to deal with this, and he's going to make this claim. They believe there's many ways to heaven. Jesus says he is the way, singular, the way to heaven. But first, before we get into all that, let's talk about heaven itself. Where is heaven? Heaven's in another dimension. We're not told exactly the location, but it's in another dimension. The new Jerusalem, he says, is going to descend from heaven, and that's where we're going to reside. It's 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep. It's a big cube, uh, and you look at the square footage of that, it's almost over 2 million million square square feet. I can't even imagine that. And someone's done the math on that, of course. Why wouldn't they? Uh, you know, and they figured out that each person, they figured out how many people are, are likely in heaven and you know, how much space based on the measurements and everything. And, and there's multiple acres per person. You'll be really thankful to know that, that you're going to have multiple acres. In your, in your, and someone did a great service by calculating all that out. I don't know about all those details. All I know is that it'll be everything that God meant it for us to be, and it'll, all, it'll be a blessing. But it's in another, another, another dimension. Jesus said that temporal things are visible, and the invisible things are eternal. There's a whole other dimension we don't know anything about. And there's, there's glimpses of it in Scripture, like Elisha asked for his servant to be able to see in the spirit realm. He was able to see all of the angels around and chariots of fire and all these things. There is another the whole dimension, another, another spirit realm that we don't see that's all around us. If you, ever re, if you ever get a chance to read this present darkness, who's read that or heard of the book? Who's even just heard of it? One, two, three, four. Wow, that's surprising. This present darkness, you should, man, that, that book, I was a new believer when I read that. Whew, hard to go to sleep after reading a little bit of that. But that is a fictionalized version of kind of what happens in the spirit realm and how demons fight angels and all these things. And, and um, it's, really, um, it's really powerful to, to, to read a version or someone's idea of a version of what's going on in the spirit realm. But heaven... Is that we don't know where it is right now, but we know heaven can hear us, uh, and we know that that it, that heaven we have our citizenship in heaven. Paul wrote about that that our citizenship is in heaven, and so the issue is though, how do we get there? How do we get to heaven? You know, the world believes and says all the time, when people anyone dies, they go to heaven. It's just automatic, and Jesus said, no, that's not the case at all. And we have to trust what Jesus said. Jesus knows a little bit about heaven. He came from there. And he's God in human flesh. And if everybody 
automatically went to heaven, there'd be no need for him to come and die in our place. The fact that Jesus came to this earth and lived the perfect life and died in our place and rose from the dead screams at all humanity that not everybody goes to heaven when they die. I've had people try to get me to say when I'm officiating a funeral, please tell, t- tell everybody that they're in heaven. And I'm like, I don't know. I didn't know them. I didn't know them. And ultimately, no one knows anyone's heart, but I don't know anything about this person. I'm not going to say they're in heaven. I, I, I can't do that. But, but I can be faithful to talk about God's faithfulness to them because we know no matter if they knew the Lord or not, God was faithful to them and loved them and, and, was, and showed his, you know, reigns on the just and the unjust. He, you know, all these things. Pray for pastors. It's hard to do funerals sometimes uh, when you deal with the family dynamics and all of that. You just try to be faithful to what God's word says and to love the family. But it can be difficult at times. So how do we get there? More, more precisely, who is the way? That's what Jesus is going to talk about today in our, in our verses. So let's see what he says. Look at verse 4. He says, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. So Jesus, without hesitation, without hesitating at all, he clearly says they know where he is going and they know the way. Now notice Thomas boldly contradicts him in in verse 5. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Remember in school when no one understood what the teacher was saying, and one kid raises their hand and says, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And you're so thankful for that one student that said that because you didn't understand. You didn't want to say that you didn't understand in front of everybody. But this person speaks up and says, I don't know, I don't get it. And then you get the benefit of them exposing their lack of knowledge uh, by you hearing the teacher further explain it. I was so thankful for those, <laughs> for those students, you know, because I didn't get to look as stupid as I was um, and, uh, or, or un- unlearned. Let me just be uh, more precise. Not, not stupid, but uh, I felt stupid. So Thomas did even better than that, though, if you really think about it, if you really look at the words that he actually says. Notice he says, we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Thank you, Thomas, for being the official spokesman for all of us here. He feels free to do that. I don't know if they somehow, he just somehow knew that they all didn't know, or he assumed it, or they had a chance to talk during this whole time. I don't know, but he clearly says, we don't know. But Jesus knew that they did know. You know, he wasn't just using hyperbole. He was saying, you know the way. He knows what they know and what they don't know. Um, so he, he, he tells them, you know the way. And it's like they're, they're just not hearing. You know, there's a difference between hearing and listening. It's like they weren't listening. They were hearing what he said, but they weren't listening to what he says. And their hearts were troubled. Their, their minds were reeling from the things that he was saying. So, of course, I mean, we're just put ourselves in their position. We would probably be doing the same thing. So we can't be too uppity and looking down on them for sure but this he said um he said that they knew the way because they knew what he just had said he said i'm going away in my father's house are many mansions and i go to prepare a place for you that's where he's going he just told him where he's going but before we get too critical of them we have to understand that they were just reeling from this situation and so we have to be patient with them. <laughs> and, but he says, you know the way. They knew him because he was about to tell them that he is the way. He's the answer. He's the means by which anyone goes to be with the Father. And so he said, I just explained it to you, basically. And, but they're not quite understanding. They're not perceiving it. Um, but he says this famous verse in verse 6. He says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. One of the most famous verses in all the Bible. Unbelievers really dislike that verse. It really makes them uncomfortable. They hate that Jesus said it. Jesus said it though. We didn't say it. If you're here today and you're new new to the things of the scriptures and you're upset by this because you're, you maybe you think in terms of pluralism, you think there's many roads to heaven. And, and, but Jesus is the one who said it. So don't get mad at us. Get mad at Jesus if you're going to get mad at anybody. He said that he's the way. We didn't say it. And, and so he says, I am the way. Now, they want Jesus to be a way. They want Jesus to be one of many roads. They get so upset. You know, today in today's culture, 
broad is what's popular. Broad. Jesus said broad is the road that leads to destruction. But what's valued today is I get to choose. I get to choose um, how to get to heaven. It's up to me to decide the way. What if I invited you over my house and you've never been to my house before and I'm trying to tell you how to get to my house and you go, I get to choose how to get to your house. I get to choose how to get there. I don't need to know your address. I don't need to know you getting specific with where you, where you live, how to find your house. That's up to me. That's so narrow of you to say that you get to decide how I'm supposed to get to your house. I need many ways to get to your home. That'd be so ridiculous. You know, we like narrowness when it suits us. You know, we, we, we wouldn't want our, before we go into surgery, the surgeon tell us, you know, this is normally the way that I do this, but I kind of want more and one choice. I kind of want to choose a whole new way that I've never tried before to be able to heal your body or operate on your body. Or what if the pilot, when you got on board of a plane, said, you know, I'm not going to go by the way that I'm usually I'm supposed to go. I'm going to just take my own route because I just feel like I want to have choices. And what would you do? You'd be saying, I want my money back for my ticket. You know, it's like we want narrowness because narrowness is the way that things have been set up. There aren't many ways to heaven. And Jesus knows that he uniquely is qualified to be able to be the way. The height of pride and arrogance, the world believes, is someone saying that there's only one way to heaven. But the thing that they don't realize is that the invitation is to all. The invitation is to all, but there's one way to heaven. And they say, you're not being very tolerant. Well, you're not being tolerant of my narrow view. So you're not tolerant. You can't be intolerant of, you can't be intolerant of intolerance because you cancel yourself out. No, I'm just kidding. But you know, we, you, the people that claim to be the most understanding, the, the most tolerant are the ones oftentimes are the most narrow-minded. So they say that sincerity is really all that matters. As long as you're sincere, you can believe any belief system and it's valid. The problem is that all these religions and belief systems contradict each other. They, they, they logically can't all be true. Either they're all false or one's true because they all contradict each other. It's just logic. And they say that we are engaged in blind faith. We're engaged in, in not rational thought or irrational thought. And they claim to be educated, they claim to be rational, but every single truth claim that they espouse or they promulgate or they, they, they pass along are all narrow truth claims. Because truth is narrow. If I say, I can say this because Dallas is not in the room, but if I say that the Dallas Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl, I'm automatically saying that 31 other teams are not going to win the Super Bowl. Truth by its nature is narrow. And to fight against that, you have to make a narrow truth claim which actually contradicts your whole position. It's not rational. It's not logical. So because Jesus said he's the way, we have to accept that. We have to humble ourselves and say, first of all, does God have the right to make it however he wants? I ask people that sometimes. Does God have the right to make it okay for it to be narrow or for it to be broad? Does God have the right to choose? Yes, God has the right to choose. He could have made many ways to heaven. He could have made many roads that lead to heaven, but he didn't. And the reason why is because God's a moral God. This is a mass, with a huge newsflash. You know, God's moral. He's moral, and he's made going to heaven based on righteousness. The problem is, is that we inherited a sinful nature from our parents, and they inherited a sinful nature from their parents, and it goes all the way back to the first parents. So we inherit this sinful nature, and once we sin one time, we're disqualified because we're not measured against other people. We're measured against God's standard of holiness, which is perfection because he's perfect. So we fall short of that, and so God has revealed a, a, a solution in his son. And he didn't just say, I'm going to give you a a Messiah. And when he shows up, you need to trust him, the one that claims he's the Messiah, because there's been many people that have claimed to be the Messiah. But what he did was he put hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament, very specific ones. Someone has calculated for seven prophecies to be true from random chance. 
it's the same odds as if you covered the whole state of Texas three feet deep with silver dollars and painted one red and someone picked out the red one on the first try. That's the same odds for seven prophecies to come true. There are hundreds of prophecies that are in the Old Testament and dozens and dozens and dozens that Jesus specifically fulfilled, specifically fulfilled where he would be born. He wasn't in control of that. How many pieces of silver would be, you know, would be given for his betrayal? He didn't have any control of that. There's so many things, his lineage. I can go on and on and on and on. There's so many beautiful brushstrokes in the Old Testament painting this portrait of the Messiah. So when he came, we wouldn't miss him. There's no blind faith. Look at the scriptures. Look at Isaiah 53. Look at that beautiful description of the suffering servant. Look at Micah 5.2. It talks about where he would be born. Look at Isaiah 7.14, that he would be born of a virgin. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Our faith is not blind faith. Our faith is based on fact and evidence. God doesn't tell us to check our brains at the door to become a Christian. You know, it's faith. We have to, he calls us to love, us, love him with our mind in addition to other things. We can't love him with our mind if it goes against reality and goes against what's true. So truth by its very nature is narrow. And Jesus is the only way and God's okay with it. And, and what, what I want to get to with my first point is don't ever be ashamed that Jesus claims to be the only way to God. Paul wrote in chapter 1 of Romans, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and how God provided only that as the means by which we would be saved. That's the only way to heaven. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And there was silence then, and there's silence today. Nobody can meet that standard that he met by dying in our place. So don't let the culture intimidate you into silence. It doesn't matter what the reaction's going to be. You know, God hasn't called us to share the gospel only when there's a good reaction to the gospel. He calls us to be faithful to preaching that gospel even when people have a bad response to it. You know, that's what, that's what being faithful to preach the gospel means. It's, it's no matter what people's reaction to it, we're going to be faithful to preach that amazing gospel. It's not loving to withhold truth from people, even if they're going to reject it, because that's what the Holy Spirit can use in their lives as we're faithful. He says amen to the scriptures that we proclaim. He says amen to that by his Holy Spirit, and we're cooperating with the Holy Spirit in how he works when we're faithful to preach the gospel. It's not loving to withhold that from people. Jesus is the only one who's qualified to be the Messiah. He's the only one who fulfilled hundreds of prophecies. He's the only one who performed miracles. He's the only one who lived a perfect life. He's the only one who took our punishment on the cross. He's the only one who rose from the dead. And he's the only one uniquely qualified to claim he's the only way. Anybody can say they're the way, but what do they back it up with? What evidence is there that they are legitimate and they can say that they're the only way? Jesus fulfilled all those things. Well, people may say that's narrow-minded. Well, Jesus said what he said because he's loving. He said, the truth shall set you free. And so most people that have a problem with the exclusivity claims of Jesus Christ disagree with, with those things without recognizing the unique qualifications that he had to be able to say that. And so we have to understand that he's, he's saying it because he's qualified to say it. But also he says he's, he's the, the truth. And, and the truth is, by nature, like I said, it is narrow. People are a lot like Pilate was when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? They claim, you have your truth, I have my truth. None of that is rational. None of that is based in reality. There are perceptions and opinions, and, and there, there is um, subjective truth in the sense of things that I experience, but in terms of something historical that claims to be valid, those things need to be looked at and investigated fairly with an with a open mind, be willing to, to have it take us wherever the truth leads. Nobody ever researches and looks at Christianity fairly 
with all the evidence and ever comes to another conclusion other than that Jesus is the only way. If they're seeking truth at all costs. Sometimes people don't want to be bothered with the truth. They just want to believe what they want to believe. So the concept of truth has been under attack a long time. Ever since the garden where, where um, Satan attacked God's word and said, did God really say? Ever since then, truth has been under attack. That's one of the reasons why we see truth being promulgated or shared as something that's relative and doesn't have any underpinnings of reality. So we have to understand that. And I love the fact that God doesn't apologize for it. Jesus doesn't wonder, doesn't take a poll, doesn't take focus group polls ahead of time, wonder how this is going to play in the culture, wonder what you know the reaction is going to be. He just says the truth. He just reveals that he is the truth. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And I, it's just a beautiful thing to see how God just lays it out, and, and we have to um, recognize that you know, that God reveals this to us to share. And one of the things we have to understand related to God's wisdom, it was with God's wisdom that bypassed man's wisdom to reveal the truth to us by his Holy Spirit. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He said, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And then he goes on to say the whole famous verse, no eye is seen, no ear is heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared in advance, those who love him. That's not talking about heaven. That's talking about God revealing the truth of the gospel to us, and no man has seen it has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared in terms of the gospel and the new covenant than what he has revealed. He bypassed man's wisdom entirely. That's why man can't get credit for it. That's why man doesn't get any glory for God's truth and God's gospel that he's revealed to us. So, and then he says he is the life and he's the only one to abundant and eternal life. He's the only one that can offer it. He's the source of all life. He's the creator. We're told in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is above all things, and in him all things consist. So he's the creator. He can offer eternal life. He's the one that created us. Um, but also he's the one who provided the solution to man's righteousness problem. And, and one of the things that's, that marks Christianity also is that God offers salvation as a free gift. In all the other belief systems, you have to earn it. In all other belief systems, you have to do works and, and do something to earn a right standing with God. And man didn't think of, ever think of the reality that that is impossible and that God provided salvation as a gift we just have to receive it we would never have thought up that god would be this gracious we never would have thought up that god would offer salvation as a free gift we just have to receive it um, there our good works can't outweigh our bad works or our sin we can never do that so that's why we we have to have this great exchange happen where god has taken our sin and 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 we in exchange get his righteousness put to our account Second point is that Jesus perfectly represents the Father to us. Look at verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Is that all? That's not asking too much. Just show us the Father. Just have the Father appear right now. I just love the fact that they're so bold with him. You would think, I would never say that to him. But they felt so comfortable with him because they knew his love for them. And they were just honest and open with their questions and their concerns. And look how patient he was with what they said and the questions they asked. He's so faithful to, to, to be so patient. But just, you know, yeah, show us the Father. There's nothing, what else, you know, that's all. You know, and, and Jesus responds in verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? 
He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus said that in John chapter 10. Jesus and the Father are one. They are the same God. God reveals himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three are the one God. There's a doctrine called modalism that oneness Pentecostals and um, apostolic churches they deny the Trinity, unfortunately, and they believe that God has three different masks that he wears. It's one person within the one Godhead who wears three different masks. You know, he's the Father, he puts on a mask and appears as the Son, puts on another mask, and he's, and he's the Holy Spirit. That's heresy. There's one God who reveals himself in three persons, and so he's saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father is in me. You've seen the Father teach. You've seen the Father heal. You've seen the Father raise people from the dead. He just had raised Lazarus from the dead. You've, they've heard the Father teach. He, Jesus said at one point, I always do those things that please the Father. Something that we, he wants to work in our lives to have that increasingly be true as well. And so they've seen him, they've experienced him, they've lived with the Father in a sense for three years because he had the Father inside of him. And then he says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words which I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So he says, this whole time I've not done anything on my own authority. I've obeyed what the Father said Jesus when he came to earth he laid aside all the the prerogatives of deity though he never stopped being god and he did things in the power of the holy spirit and he and we don't know exactly when he was doing things in his own volition or when he was doing you know it's like you can't I, break that down to that extent but the point is is that he didn't do anything in and of himself because he was the son he was the messiah and so um he says, he dwells in me and he does the works. And then in verse 11, he adds, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So he's saying, my, the works back up who I am and what I have said to you is true. So he says, that's important for you to understand and that you, you've been with me this whole time. So you've seen the Father. I don't have to have the Father manifest himself before you. The Father is spirit. And he so... But he's saying, I recognize that you want to learn more about the Father. But if you focus on me, you've seen the Father. You've lived with the Father because you, you know me. And so I am the way, so you know the way. So they already knew where he was going. He's already said that. He, they knew the way because they knew him. So Jesus wasn't wrong. He was exactly correct with what they already knew. They just weren't listening and weren't fully understanding everything to, to their satisfaction. And, but Jesus is patient with them. He works with them. And he reveals this great doctrine of his exclusivity. How do we focus on that as we share our faith? How do we help people understand that Jesus is the only way? We just have to be bold in saying that he's the only way. It's not complicated I mean, people are going to disagree or they're not going to disagree, but the point is we can talk about these qualifications. We can talk about what makes him, what, to, what he's fulfilling and what his, what his prophecies show that he fulfilled, that he's worthy of being the way to heaven. At one point, Jesus said, we even saw it in this gospel, that he's the door. He's, he's, the, the, way, he's, he's the way that that we come to know him. And we have to accept that. We have to submit ourselves to that because no one else either comes no, at all comes close to being qualified for the Messiah. If Jesus isn't the Messiah, there is, not, there is not a Messiah that exists. Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies and there's no way any other teacher can come in and claim to be the Messiah because he's the one that, that qualifies because of all the prophecies and what he did in, this, in his life and all of that. And so Yes, there is exclusive claims of Jesus, but the thing that doesn't amaze me is that there's only one way. What amazes me is that there is even a way. And I use this analogy many times, but I'm going to say it again. When you fall overboard on a cruise ship and someone throws you a life preserver, you're not offended that there's only one way to be saved. You're just thankful that there is that you can be saved. That's the idea. It's his business on how many ways there are to heaven. And, and all that. And in his wisdom, if you think about it, it's, it's the wise answer to provide 
people is that he is the only one uniquely qualified to pay for your sin and to, to be your Messiah and to be the way to the Father. And, and he says the, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That is something that we should be thankful for. We get to know about the Father based on Jesus and what he's provided to us. And, if, and at one point Jesus said, he does not receive the Son, does not receive the Father who sent me. It's a package deal. You get to the Father by going through the Son. If you reject the Son, there is no way to the Father. He's the door. He's the way that we get to the Father. And it's something we should be very thankful for and be faithful to communicate and not be shy about. It doesn't matter how bad the culture gets and how much they think that that's offensive and don't want to hear it. The point is, Jesus wants us to be faithful to preach that gospel and we can get into all the reasons why he's worthy to be the way, but ultimately we have to communicate to them there is a way to be saved. And you should be thankful that there is a way to be saved because no other religious guru or prophet deals with righteousness. No other prophet deals with holiness. They all say, you just have to work for it. You have to be busy religiously and somehow your your good works will outweigh your sin. But Jesus says, no, you can never be good enough. The standard is perfection. When we think we can, make, we can earn our way to heaven, we're thinking that the standard is lower than it really is. The standard is perfection. And, and that's why when I explain that to people and they go, well, that means everyone's a sinner, like as if they did some chess checkmate and got me. And I'm like, no, you're right. That's right. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You know what I mean? Like, like that's true. We're all sinners. Even, they're like, even you need a, a savior. Like, that's right. You're agreeing with me. I, don't, I can't save myself, just like you can't save yourself. We all have to come the same way. We have to humble ourselves. Like it says, the, the ground is, is level at the foot of the cross. Everybody has to go to the foot of the cross, humble themselves, and, and accept Jesus as their Savior and to trust in Jesus for salvation, not their own work. So we need to be faithful to that message. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for righteousness being only through you. Thank you that you impute that righteousness to us. Thank you that you put the, that righteousness to our account and we're legally yours. We're in Christ, those of us that know you in this room. Lord, if there's anyone listening in the room or online, I pray, Lord, that they would make that decision to trust in you alone to pay their way to heaven, thus bringing them into a relationship with you. We thank you that we get to carry this message. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.